Hi, I'm Susan Shaner with Community Forum, and I have the great pleasure to have with me Peter Muir, who is a pianist, educator, and author. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Great pleasure to be here. Um, so can you give us a, a little overview on your background? You're trained as a classical pianist, correct? That, that's right. Yeah. I, I originally trained um, in England, where I come from, at the Royal College of Music. And uh, I, I trained, yeah, as you said, as a classical pianist. And I left music college um, with a degree and everything. And um, <coughs> having received a lot of music lessons and being able to do really quite a lot of things pretty well um, on the piano, which, as you said, is my instrument. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt somehow that there was something lacking in what I was doing. That there was, I could play an awful lot of notes fast and but there's something, there was something really missing. And um, a long time, just shortly after I left college, which was 25 years ago, the, um, a, a student of mine lent me a book by a medical doctor called John Diamond. Oh yes, yes. Who was writing about using music to help people for therapeutic purposes. Mm -hmm. And this really intrigued me because um, uh, I, I come actually from a medical background because both my parents were doctors. Oh. And I, in a way, I was, I think, interested in, in the healing, always interested in the healing side, if unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And um, when I read this book, I knew that what I wanted to do was to use music, not just to go out and perform and give concerts mm -hmm. and entertain people, which is what music is usually used for in our culture. Yes. What I wanted to do was actually use it to do something more with it um, and to use Dr. Diamond's language to raise the life energy of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I worked extensively with him and still am closely associated with him. And I run his Institute for Music and Health, which is up in Dutchess County, New York. Um, and for 25 years now, I've been working with many different types of people uh, on the basis of using, not just teaching music as a skill, mm -hmm. but using it to actually help transform their lives. So it's really music therapy. It's similar to music therapy, yes. yes. It, uh, the work that we do is a little bit different from what you might call mainstream music therapy. Okay. Music therapy has traditionally been the work of musicians like myself who've mm -hmm. become interested in, in using music for that purpose. Yes. But this is a medical doctor who has um, a whole approach using all the arts and uh, as well as music. John, John Diamond. This is John Diamond, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing them really all together. And that fascinated me because, for instance, he was writing about how music could be used to enhance the acupuncture system. Huh. And how is that? How would that work? Well, um, everything, <laughs> everything affects the acupuncture system. Everything affects chi, or the word that he uses for that is life energy. Yeah, because you're, yeah, your energetic system, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything affects it. Mm -hmm. um, we have this plant here, that's, has that's affecting, it yeah. has energy, but it's also, it's affecting us in a particular way. Everything, all, and so all um, food we eat, yes. the air we breathe, the environment that we live in, um, and also the music that we listen to, the art that we look at, it all affects our life energy. And he investigated this very, very thoroughly um, over a period of oh, 30, 40 years. Um, and the results are really unique. And so from that, we have a, um, a whole sort of printout of the best way, the optimum way to make music, to not just to use it for entertainment, but to use it to really help people. Mm -hmm. So I know we have a clip to see you actually performing. You playing at the I believe piano. so, yes. All right, so, so do you want to tell us about what this clip is? I, I believe we're going to see the ending of, of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. And this is a performance I gave uh, last year um, up in uh, Dutchess County uh, with a wonderful orchestra up there, the Northern Dutchess Symphony Orchestra. And um, the Rhapsody in Blue is very special for me because Ger it was written by George Gershwin as you probably know. And what Gershwin was trying to do was he was trying to bring together two styles of music. Mm -hmm. American music of jazz and blues and um, the, um, the European classical music as well. Those two traditions to bring them together. And of course, he s succeeded magnificently in fusing them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I've tried to do in my own playing career and with my musical interests is to bring those two styles together. Um, so I play 
I perform jazz and ragtime and blues and things like that, as well as classical music. Okay. And this piece kind of brings it together. So it's kind of symbolic of where I stand, okay. culturally speaking. Okay, great. Okay, so we're gonna go to the clip. So, <laughs> so you were really, I mean, your head was moving, you had a real flare, I mean, and at the end. So what were you feeling while you were playing that piece? Elation. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, particularly the ending. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult work, of course, and, and uh, you, get to the, you get to the end of that, and you, it's, like, it's hard to describe, but it's like you're on the home run, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. finally, you, you, you're, you're on the way home. And uh, you know that the whole thing's kind of just gonna, going to uh, come together. So there's a feeling of just like, and, th and that's the brilliant thing about this, that work. Um, when it was written, everybody, it, was crit it was quite widely criticized because, and it has been since by musicologists, because logically mm -hmm. the piece doesn't hold together at all. Mm -hmm. Like most symphonic works and concertos and things like that, they have this logical construction. But Rhapsody in Blue doesn't have that logical thing. So it's been criticized by people who know a great deal about music. Mm -hmm. But everyone else, which is 95% of the population, just love it, right? Everybody yeah, knows yeah. and loves that work. Yeah. And at the end of the piece, there is some way in which Gershwin just brings together all the, the tensions and all the drama that's been happening in the piece. And it all just sort of resolves and uplifts b beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he, he has a unique way of doing it. It's really no, nobody else did that before, and nobody's really done it since. No, that was uh, just that was very inspirational. Now I know you, you said you also, so you train in classically, but you also do jazz and blues yes, and rags. Right. And so you wrote a book, Long Lost Blues, that's Popular right. Blues in America, 1850 to 1920. How did you come to write that and? Well, I actually, um, I came out to this country to, um, to do, um, originally to do a PhD, um, which I did at City University of New York. And the subject of the PhD was, was blues, the origins of blues. It was really um, look closely connected with what I wrote about in the book. And the reason for that is that, you remember I started off this interview saying that when I came out of music college, I knew that something was missing yes, in my playing. Yes. And I, t I talked about it in terms of what you might call the, the music for well-being aspect, uh -huh. using the music therapeutically. But there's another side to that too, which is you go to classical music college, you, all you learn about is classical music. And when I tell you a story, in my last year at music college, I had a, a fellowship and I could basically do whatever I wanted in that year. They said, you can do anything you want. It's good. We think very highly of you. It was a wonderful opportunity. Wow, isn't that nice? That was very nice of them. <laughs> and I said, um, here's what I want to do. I want to take lessons in jazz piano. And, like, uh oh, and wah, like, wah, wah. Uh, no, when we said we want you could do anything you wanted, <laughs> classical. Uh, no, not, not, yeah, anything classical. <laughs> and they basically refused to pay, play for, for, for jazz, jazz lessons. So I had to work it all out for myself. So I started getting interested oh. in jazz at that time. And the way that I see it, if you think of a coin, a coin has a head and it has a tail. Yeah. Right? And in terms of music, there's on one side is what you might call the American side. Mm -hmm. which is the jazz, the blues, the ragtime, all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And then on the other side, there is the European side, the classical music. And I, I see that if you're really trying to straddle music, if you're really trying to understand it, you have to really be engaged in both sides as I see it. Obviously you can specialize, people do, but, but you have to have a, mm -hmm. be able to embrace both sides of it. 
And that's what I really wanted to do in my, my PhD. It's like I really wanted to get deeply into the American side of it through my study of it, mm -hmm, which, mm -hmm. through musicology, but also in terms of performing it. And, yeah. and I perform that probably actually more than I perform the classical, because in this country, there's more of a demand for that kind of music, for yeah. the vernacular music. Than yes. there. But more important than that, when you're working with people, which is uh, just to move to that subject of working with people, using music to help people therapeutically, you have to be able to reach them on their terms. And most people, for most people, classical music is just too hard technically. Like if you have somebody who's starting singing, yes. they're not going to be able to sing much opera or something like that, even if they are partial to the start. It's too technically demanding. Yeah, so you're, so you're trained you have the whole academic background, but yes, let's move to that topic where you said now your focus is really using it for well-being and working with people. Right. And I know you work with special needs population. I certainly do. Yes. And um, unfortunately, I wish that clip. We know that clip isn't working, but um, I went on your website and I looked at a lot of your clips. Thank you. It was very moving that um, some of the young men and there was a young woman um, who have autism who you worked with. Right. So there was one, oh gosh, Hello Dolly, was that? It? That was, <laughs> it that, was so that, cute. Yeah, that was a, that's a young man who I've been working with for some years. Yeah. Who's, who's extraordinary. Now when you think of people with autism, what you think yeah. is people who are kind of very withdrawn and very in themselves. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this wonderful young man, he, he, um, he is a bit withdrawn in a certain way, but he loves to perform and engage people in sort of the act of performance. Yeah. And he's he's a very flamboyant performer, um, <laughs> very very theatrical. Yes. Very theatrical. Yes. And he has a way of connecting with audiences that is not only paradoxical in terms of his autism, it, yeah. it's almost... I mean, I, I'm, almost, I'm trying to understand this phenomenon better, but it's kind of because of it. it it's, it's almost like... Here's what's in my mind as I'm talking to you. If you imagine an object that is brightly lit, like say, just yeah. look at this glass say, yeah. on this table. Mm -hmm. Now we have a, just imagine we had a spotlight on that glass. Mm -hmm. So the heck what? But imagine that this studio was lit in such a way that it was completely dark all around. Yeah, then and it would all be, we yeah. saw was this. That would be dramatic, more That dramatic. would be very yeah. dramatic. And because yeah. of this, because he, he, in other areas of life, he, he's, as it were, there's as what you might call darkness in, in a certain way. It's like it, he's not functioning very high. This gives an intensity yeah. to, to, because this is his one avenue of communication. Yes. I mean, take you and me. So I'll go home, I'll communicate with my wife, I hope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then tomorrow I'll be communicating with some students. Yes. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. I'll be on the phone to people. Blah, blah. But this is, so we have all these different avenues of communication. Yes. But with Kevin, this is his, av his this is his only yeah, The way that he can connect. Yeah. And this means everything to yeah. him. How did you get into this work? Because those clips are just they're so endearing. They all have their own individual style. Correct. and. I was really touched by them. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I'm delighted you looked at them, thank you. Yeah. Um, I got into it originally um, about as soon as I, really almost around the same time um, that I got interested in the whole idea of using music as therapy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a colleague of mine um, who was a piano teacher um, was moving to change, she was moving, this was in England, and this mm -hmm. was in about 1990. Um, she was moving uh, to another, another country, and she handed me a student um, called Derek. Derek was 11 years old. So you were just teaching piano? I was doing piano teaching. I was yeah. actually teaching at a, a, a top private school called Westminster School, mm -hmm. and she was actually another teacher there, yeah. And um, uh, so I, and this was a private student of hers, she, Derek. This kid, 11 years old, um, blind, um, very autistic. He didn't speak any language at all. Um, the only thing he would do was what they called echolalia, which is if you say hello, Derek, he would he would say he wouldn't say hello, Peter. He would say hello, Derek. Yes, back, so yes, just echo you. Mm -hmm. Really, no language at all. Yeah. But you'd sit and and angelic-looking kid, was a shock of blonde hair, mm -hmm. and you right as I'm talking to you now, I can see him so clearly at the age of eleven. But you'd sit him down at the piano and you'd say, okay, um, okay, Derek, let's have um, A misbehaving. F sharp major, five four time, play the melody with your left hand, and he'd be off. 
He could do it, and it, and all, then he could say, "Okay, wow. we're going, let's do it. Let's do it today. Let's do it in the style of um, uh, Oscar Peterson." Okay, now change to Jelly Roll Morton. Now change to Scott Joplin. So he could understand, oh, but he couldn't. That. He couldn't communicate. How did he learn how to play? By ear. He had, he had, as, oh as a gosh, number so of people... Oh, he was gifted. Have, yeah, oh yeah. And he's become a celebrity since. He's had a 60 Minutes documentary made about him. His name is Derek Paravicini. Um, and he's, he's a wow. national... So he's become a national kind of celebrity. Really, how did you? England. How did so when he first came to you as a student? So he was already playing on his own. Yes. How did you learn how to work with him and how to communicate with him? Oh, pure instinct, which is yeah. which is all you're ever using when you have people with disabilities, because you can't, you can never work with them, or very rarely, in the ways that you have been taught to teach. Yes. Think about, did you, did, I mean, I don't know if you ever learned instruments when you were a kid or anything. I tried but, my best. I'm just uh, not musical. Although I was trained as an expressive arts therapist. Really? I, I have an expressive therapy background. Okay. Well, yeah. when you say you're not music, so, <laughs> so, well, what tends to happen? Clarinet, which, I tried. <laughs> clarinet? My wife's a clarinetist. The, 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 but you, but you, you, see, you see, you say you're not musical. See, this is, this is where I disagree. I would love to be musical. I love music. I love to dance. I love, I love music. No, yeah. no, no. If you love music, you're musical. That's the end of the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. What, what, you have, what you don't have is you don't have a way of bringing out the music mm -hmm. that's inside you. And that the conventional way didn't work for you. And it yeah. doesn't work. In reality, it doesn't work for a lot of people. Not just people who are special needs. I'm talking about what they call neurotypicals. Yeah. Well, when my band leader sort of made me a spectacle and I was a little stressed with, you know, doing the solo, that probably didn't help anything. Right. And it's all that... <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's right. That's, so that encourages nervousness and, and all, all this. I, I've got a wonderful story about that. Um, just from just recently, the other day, I, I work in a, a place uh, in a sort of halfway house for uh, people with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. well, that's, a, that's a tough population. That's a tough I've population. I've worked for that population. You have? Yes. Well, we, it's, 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 we work in this, I work in this place in, in Poughkeepsie. Um, Poughkeepsie, and we have a whole program there. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we 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 get into, we teach them the old songs like mm -hmm. "You Are My Sunshine," and we take them into nursing homes and we have them sing with the seniors. Oh, how wonderful! And the idea about this, which is the opposite of what you had to go through when you were in band, is to use your music, your own musical creativity, altruistically to help other people, yeah, is to get yeah. people thinking outwards with music. Right, they're not focused on themselves. You got it. Yeah. This is the key. Yeah. This is the key. And that's at the center really of a lot of what we, go, what we do. Mm -hmm. Take for instance autism. Now autism comes from a, a Greek root, which is the same as automatic, and it means self. I never thought about that, that's interesting. So it's so autism is as it were self, which is the standard sort of psychological perception of autism that yes. other people don't exist, it's just the self as yes. it were. And um, you take autism and then on the other hand you take altruism. Altruism meaning helping other people. Right, right. That comes from a Latin word meaning uh, alter, which is other. It's the same word actually. Mm -hmm. Like alternate is when you other, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So you're going so if you if you take people with autism and you give them enough altruism, you encourage their innate sense of altruism enough yes. in the right way, it helps the autism. It helps take them out of the autism. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. So, I mean, you picked up on all of this it's kind of intuitively. I mean, you haven't been trained as a clinician or anything. Well, no, I trained actually with Dr. Diamond and that oh. whole approach using the altruism, okay. that was really his work. And that, that is an extraordinary contribution okay. he has because nobody else is really talking about this. It's really just him. And we've taken this and developed whole programs out of this. Now, my colleague elsewhere, um, for instance, my colleague in um, Australia, at the Australian National University, mm -hmm. Professor Susan West, she's done this with a whole population in the city of Canberra. Um, they have thousands and thousands of primary school kids there who um, every week will go into nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that when you do that and you use music to um, actually enhance the lives of the populations of the nursing homes, yeah. it gives you a whole different. Yeah, thing. it's great. It's great for the residents. It's also great for right. the students. It's and great. It's great for the students. And yeah. just to come back to your experience that you had with the band. Yeah, if we it's, have to. It, 
<laughs> but let's just say, let's just say you've been playing a band song. Let's just say, yeah. uh, whatever. You are my sunshine. Okay. Right. If instead of doing what you had to do, you were holding the hands of a senior, as kids generally like to do, and singing the song and looking into their eyes and seeing them sing oh, back. Oh, it would have been a very different day, experience. You would still be making music now. Well, you know what it was? Uh, and, we, we, and, uh, sorry, and more yeah. important than that, sorry to interrupt you, <laughs> and more important than that, you believe yourself to be musical because you said a few minutes ago you weren't musical. Well, we had to take an exam to see how musical we were. And I remember I, I had to walk up <laughs> I'm over it now. But I had to walk up and stand besi beside the teacher, and she pointed down to my, my grade on that exam. And I remember looking down, and I had tears in my eyes because I so, you know what I really wanted to play? I wanted to play the saxophone, and then I wanted to play the drums. And this, my score only allowed me to play the, the, low, the thing that you needed, like the, the lowest musical <laughs> intelligence. So the only thing that I got beyond the recorder was the... Um, the clarinet, <laughs> but I remember oh. being so devastated because I really wanted to play. In my opinion, the mu um, music exams or those those type of tests, they only show one kind of intelligence. Yeah. Only one show. There's many kinds of music intelligence. They only show one kind. It's a bit like saying that um, that uh, you know because you have say. Not, you're not the highest IQ or something, you can't be a CEO or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, there are all these different types of intelligence. Yes, and the right. music exams only show one type <clears throat> of intelligence, and therefore they, they really limit what people can do. Now this story I was going to, let me just tell me yeah. that the story I was going to yeah. tell you about, about this schizophrenia. We never got Oh about yes, the, yes, uh-huh. So, so we got this young man there um, who, who moved into this residential home for schizophrenics recently. Yes. Uh, very withdrawn and everything, and um, and obviously very very ill. And I said, "Do you sing?" And he said, "No, I don't sing." And I said, "Well, what you know? What's the problem?" And he said, "Well, he said when I was in seventh grade, the mm -hmm. the chorus teacher said you sing off key, um, so you better sit at the back." As a matter of fact, and they kicked him out of chorus. Oh, and poor guy. That was it. He hasn't sung since. <clears throat> so I said, "Okay." All right. Why don't you well, sing especially anyway? somebody who has, who has schizophrenia might be more fragile than somebody else could just brush it off and be like, okay, whatever. Yeah, are absolutely right yeah. about that. Yeah, and the the and, and it certainly got to him. And I, the moment I met him, I knew that he had this very strong relationship with music. It was very very obvious to me. And how did so, you know that? Uh, it's, a, it's just a very strong feeling yeah. you can get. You have a strong relationship with music. I can feel that, too. <laughs> I like to dance. <laughs> no, more than just liking to dance. No, I feel you have a strong connection with music that, that has never... I, 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 what can I do? Okay. Anyway, so, so what happened with him? Anyway, so, uh, so, so what happened with him was that he... he um, so I got him to sing, and, and so he joined in, and he seemed very happy and everything. Now the guy's Irish or comes from an Irish background, so he yes. starts. He starts. He says, "Do you have like a book of Irish songs?" I see. That's it. I'm I'm part Irish too. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. You are, you are or not? No. I am part Irish. You yeah. are also there. Yeah. And he said, he said, uh, he said do, you, do you have any Irish songs? So I bought in a book of Irish songs. He said, I want to sing this one. He said, this one I know. The Dubliners uh, recorded this uh, one. So, we, so you know, and we, we had him do it. And he was, he's fantastic. He's absolutely fantastic. And he's, he now comes on all our programs. And he's, he's so completely... you opened up a whole new world for him. Yes. And I think, I, I think you can argue. I mean, it's hard to... You can't prove the case, mm -hmm. but if he if he just stuck singing with some sort of approach in his teens, I think it would have lessened his symptoms maybe remarkably. Mm. I'll give you give you another example of that. Um, parallel case: um, a, a man I, I knew who um, was very overweight and um, chain smoked, and he 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 uh, he. I gave a talk somewhere, and he came up afterwards and introduced himself. And he said, "He said, I'm one of those people that got kicked out of, of chorus." He said, "And what's more," he said, "I was bursting to play the saxophone." And he he used the word bursting, and it was like he was a big guy, you know. He said, "I was just bursting oh, wow. to play the saxophone," and I said, "Well, what happened?" He said, "Well, we couldn't afford private lessons, so but you could get free lessons from school if you passed a test." So he said, oh, so what was the test? He says, well, you turn up on a winter's morning at like eight o'clock in the morning. He said, I didn't know anything about music. So there's a moody music teacher who's sitting at the piano saying, uh, she plays a note, says, sing this note, plays a note, sings a note. So he goes, you didn't have no idea what she was talking about. Uh, so he goes, la, you know. And she says, that's wrong. Okay, here's another one. But 
Yeah. I'm wrong. sorry, you're not good and enough. You're not, you're, this thing. And I just think, if if he'd just imagine that she'd been a bit more sort of empathetic yeah. and, and yeah. encouraged him and, and went with his enthusiasm rather than the fact he couldn't pass this particular kind of very prescribed test. Yes. Um, smoking and eating is oral, right? Yes. And so saxophone. Yeah. So imagine so that. Maybe he, he, maybe, maybe yeah. that would have helped him enormously. Yeah. Maybe a, a trauma goes back. You see, these things are very Yeah, they are. Important. Yeah, there's big traumas and little traumas right. and how people you know, receive things. Yeah, it's very deep work. I mean, we've got about two more minutes. Um, I'm just curious. Um, it sounds like you've impacted people's lives pretty dramatically with the work that you're doing. What's, what's your vision for this work and what advice might you give someone who is working in this similar capacity or has aspirations to? Um, well, my, my, my philosophy really is that everybody has music inside them. Everybody is musical. And you just have to know the right way to access it, which the approach we developed, which we now call whole music, I think is, is quite efficient at doing. But there are other approaches too. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing is you've got to be creative. You've got to think outside the box. And you've got to try whatever it takes to, to bring the music out of the person because the person wants the music, they want the music, but they don't, it's blocked. They don't know how to do it because of the yeah. disability or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you just, you just keep trying different approaches until you find it. So you have to be prepared to do that. If you just approach things in one way, it doesn't, it, yeah, it doesn't, well, so it doesn't work. being flexible, but it also sounds like you're very intuitive, so you have a way of connecting with people. I, I guess I am fairly intuitive, but also I've got a lot of experience now of doing this. I've been doing it for 25 years, so I've, I have like a lot of, as it were, clinical experience. So with Dr. Dime, and this whole music approach is the one that you're you're implementing. And so if somebody if somebody was interested in either learning more about this whole music approach or seeing some of your wonderful clips and getting inspired. Um, where would they go to? What's the website? They can start off by going to my personal website, which is petermuir.com. Okay, and, and um, you want to spell that? Yeah, Peter, P-E-T-E-R, and then my last name is Muir, M-U-I-R, and of course that's all one word, and then .com, petermuir.com. Because oh. oh. even, even just seeing those inspirational clips is just really Thank you. endearing. Thank you. So, so thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having us. Okay. Yeah, great. So I'm Susan Shaner with Community Forum. Thanks for joining us until next time.